So, so much of who we are is determined for us by are the families that we are raised in, right? Like our identity, who we see ourselves as. These early years of your life, the, God created the idea of a family to be that place where a person is nurtured, where they begin to understand who they are. I've been thinking about this a lot, of course, because unfortunately this week, or fortunately this week, my beloved 96-year-old grandfather went home to be with Jesus two days after his 96th birthday, also his 73rd wedding anniversary. He went to bed with a full belly. He kissed the bride of his youth, and he woke up in the arms of Jesus this week. And it got me thinking about legacy because for me, my grandfather's legacy is so profound in my life, just the ability to humbly work hard. You know, my grandpa did a great job of keeping the big things in his life front and center. He loved his wife. He loved his family. You know, my grandma, when we were talking, I got a chance to go out there and see her this week just to, to be there and encourage her. And, you know, and she said, we didn't have much, but we had each other and we had everything we needed. You know, I was raised that way to, to remember what the most important things were. And, you know, but I started thinking about that idea of legacy and the, the legacy that my grandfather left, not only with me and my sisters and my his other grandkids, but, but also with so many people. And it started getting me thinking about, you know, our own legacies. You know, they, it's been said that if you want to live the life that you really want, you need to ask yourself, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? And then reverse engineer your life so you're living that way, so that's what they'd say. It's kind of a powerful thought, isn't it? Because a lot of times we think, well, I'll worry about my legacy at the end of my life. I'll kind of tack that thing on in the latter years. But really, your legacy is something that you're building every single day. Each one of us are, you know? And, and as I started thinking about this idea of legacy, I also started thinking about the legacy of the Crossroads family, a church in this community for almost 45 years now. Not the oldest church in the community, Definitely not the youngest church in the community, but a church that over almost a half century has had a pretty extraordinary impact in our community and, and in our world. And, but I think when you're thinking about the legacy you want to build, the legacy that a church can have, that we can have as individuals, one of the most important things is you can't forget who you are in the process. You have to be able to see yourself for who you truly are. And so... We're doing this series that we're calling Renew, which is both we're looking at who we are as a church, where we've been, what God is doing. If you weren't here uh, in our last message, I do encourage you to look it up in our archives. We talked about our specific vision for 2020. We're calling it a year of renewal, that we're going to be with Jesus, we're going to be the church, and we're going to be on mission. And today I want to kind of pull back a little bit and look at kind of the foundation of who we are. Because in all the unique focuses that you have in your life, the, the, the initiatives you're getting at, the things you're trying to do, we always want to be able to have the, who are we at the core of who we are? And so in order to kind of break this open today, I would love for you to open up your Bibles to the first epistle of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. I just want to read to you verses 9 and 10. If you're uh, don't have a Bible with you today, there's Bibles on the seats in front of you. And of course, if you have a smart device, one of the beauties of having the internet in your pocket is the Bible's on the internet. So cool. And so you can open up your favorite browser window. Just type in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Or, of course, open your Bible. And, you know, 1 Peter is one of the last books in your Bible towards the end of the New Testament, those, uh, those epistles there at the end. And it says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Now, What's beautiful here is the apostle Peter in writing this letter is explaining both the fact that there were people who rejected Jesus. They stumbled at Jesus, the stumbling stone. 
They rejected him as the Messiah, but he's saying, although some people did that, you didn't. And then you have this beautiful statement of, this is who you are. Now, this is not only true for the, the church and the churches that Peter was writing to. These are things that are true about you today. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, if you haven't stumbled at Jesus as the stumbling stone, but you've allowed Jesus to be the rock on which you build your life, he is your savior and your Messiah, then Peter tells us that we are a chosen generation. Now, know what I love so much about this idea of the chosen generation? Because we live in a day and age where we have the generation wars. You know what I mean? We're, and mostly it's just the boomers and the millennials, parents and their kids fighting about who's cooler. Now, as someone who is beautifully Gen X, like I'm kind of not in the crosshairs of this. I just kind of rocking on, doing my thing, not worrying about it. And then, of course, you have the younger generation. You know, and now we live in the day and age where the boomers love to, to, to bag on the millennials and the millennials love to bag on the boomers. You know, but the Bible says that you and I are what? A chosen generation. So the beauty is if you're a boomer, if you're a millennial, if you're Gen X, if you're Gen Z, if you don't even know what you are, guess what? You're chosen. You're God's chosen generation. You're the people that God has chosen to be his family. And that makes us, no matter if we're boomers or millennials or whatever we are, we're God's chosen people. And that's good enough for me, amen? So we don't got to bag on one another. We don't got to call each other names, say, oh, you're entitled. No, you're entitled. We forget all that stuff. You're chosen. Look at the first thing you say, you're chosen. Yeah. Powerful. We're chosen for what? Notice this. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. Wow. All of your, you ladies, your princess dreams, it's all in Christ. It says, you're a royal priesthood. You know, the idea of royalty speaks of the family members of the king. But not, not, not we're just royal, and obviously this has been in the news a little bit recently. Some people don't want to be so royal, but if you're in Christ, you are a royal, right? But you're a royal priesthood. The idea of the priests in the Bible were people who, who mediated God to the people and the people to God. That was the role of the priests in the, in, 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 in the, in, uh, the children of Israel. They stood before God in the name of the people, and they stood before the people in the name of God. Guess what? If you're in Christ... You're a royal priest. So how cool is that? But he keeps going. He can't, he can't stop himself. A holy nation. Wow. Out of all the things you can say about any nation, if someone's in Christ, they're holy. Why? Because Jesus is holy. And when someone puts their faith in Jesus, Jesus shares his holiness with us. Now, how cool is it? You just take those three things. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. And you're a holy, you're part of a holy nation. Don't forget who you are, brothers and sisters. That's who you are in Christ. And what happens when we forget who we are, we don't live into the reality of what it means to truly be in Christ. And then from there, he says that you're his own special people. Now, I always like to say that some of us are more special than others. <laughs> I, I, I think that when, you know, there's, you know, like I always joke that when God looks at me, he's like, oh, Fusco. Oh, you know, he's my special one, you know what I mean? But really, and, I, and I'm making jokes here, but, but the idea of you being his special people means he cares about you. He loves you. He values you. Don't forget who you are. If you're in Christ, you're God's special people. He loves you. And then not only that, he does all this that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Notice that? Who we are leads us to be his mouthpiece. Our job is to proclaim the praises of the one who has done this in us. We keep talking about all that we are. It's upward, inward, and outward, right? It's God. God shows us who we are, identity, and it leads us outward. You see, it's here again. Right, we believe in Jesus, that's the upward. And because of that, he says, look at what you are. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special people. That's all who we are, that we might move outward and proclaim the praises. We proclaim the glory of this one who has done this amazing work in our lives. So the upward and outward. Look, it's right here in these verses. I don't make this stuff up. I just read the word and say, this is what it says. 
And then to, to end this all, I want you to notice, and I think this is so important, that Peter gets focused on the fact that God did a work, that if God didn't do this work, we wouldn't be this person. Notice, first he says that we proclaim the praises of him, at the end of verse 9, who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So God did a work. He called us. When he, in Jesus, he called us out of a life in darkness into the marvelous light of what it means to be in Christ. Not that, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, which means that before Jesus called us, we were not his people. We were not his special people. But in his calling, we used to not be his people, but now we get to be the people of God, right? And not only that, he also says, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And what this means is that each one of us has a past, and Jesus becomes the dividing marker. We were in darkness, now we're in light. We were not a people, but now we're the people. We had not obtained mercy, but now in Christ we have obtained mercy. So Jesus is the center of who we are. And I don't know about you, I'm so grateful that God called me out of darkness. I'm so grateful that although I was not his people, he's like, you're my people. Although I had not obtained mercy in the past, now, because of Jesus, I'm a recipient of mercy. And that's not only true for me, that's true for anybody who put their faith and trust in Jesus. See, all of us have a past. We love to say, of course, every sinner has a past, right? And we realize that in Christ, every saint's got a future. God does a work in each one of us. So we can't forget who we are. Now, I share all this with you because I want to talk a little bit about who we are as a church family. So I like to say it this way. Our mission at Crossroads is simple. Our mission is simple. I think all of us should have a mission for your life. I believe that the Crossroads mission, it is so good that it should be your mission of life. And, and really, the Crossroads mission is something that for me, it's like, I want to live this. So you're saying, okay, well, what's our mission? Anybody know what the Crossroads mission is? Simply responding to Jesus. That's who we are. Our mission is that you and I, we simply respond to Jesus. That's why I say our mission is simple. Our job is to simply respond to Jesus. Simply responding to Jesus is a four-word definition for what the Bible calls discipleship. Right? See, a discipleship is someone who is learning from somebody else. And I like to say that what, when somebody puts their faith and trust in Jesus and then they're born again, then God, by his spirit, begins to transform our natural reactions into biblical responses. Like, like on the day that you get saved, or maybe right before that, someone cuts you off when you're driving and you choose to lay on that noisy thing on your steering wheel... Maybe you have a few choice words. Maybe if you were raised like me, you roll down the window so that they can hear you a little bit more clearly. <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe you, you show off certain uh, fingers that you have, and it's not the peace sign or the thumbs up, right? And, and that might be the natural reaction that you're used to having. You respond to frustration with anger. You respond to somebody coming at you, and you escalate that situation, but then you put your faith and trust in Jesus, and the Spirit of God dwells in you, and God begins to do a work of transforming those natural reactions to biblical responses, because all of a sudden, you're driving down the, 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 the road, and someone cuts you off, and when you used to just get irate, now you start to bless those who persecute you. <laughs> you begin to pray for them. You begin to say, oh, Lord, bless that driver, Lord. You love them, and I'm working on it right now. <laughs> I'm sure they have an important place to be, way more important than where I'm going, right? Now, some of you are like, I want that to happen. Listen, if you simply respond to Jesus, that will start happening. Because God wants to do a work. God, God takes us from where we are, and he moves us, and he changes us, and he transforms us in the midst of the journey. And you begin to realize that all the stuff that goes on is God's way of doing the work that he wants to do in your life. That all the struggles and all the trials and all the things that go wrong are invitations from Jesus to live differently than you would. And then along the way, you start catching yourself being like, I can't believe I just did that. And your spouse is like, what happened to you? Like, I don't know, but you're simply responding to Jesus. And as you're doing that, God is doing a work in your life. Every single day 
is an opportunity to simply respond to Jesus. Because God is inviting us into the abundant life. He's inviting us into light. He's inviting us to walk in mercy. He's inviting us to see ourselves as his own special people. Every day I wake up and say, Lord, let me simply respond to you today. It's a simple mission. Jesus says, come on, I want to do this thing. I say, okay, Lord, let's go. Right? He said, like, hey, I want to go bless these folks. Okay, Lord, I'm here. Hey, don't say that. Okay, Lord. Sit there quietly. Right? In a million different ways. In a, at your job, in your family, at home. That's the mission of this church. We talk about it all the time. We want to simply respond to Jesus. Now, from there, we take our mission and then we amplify it into what we call our vision. What does it mean to simply respond to Jesus? So I like to say, our vision is audacious. We have an audacious vision here. That word audacious, it's a big word. It makes you think that I'm smart. I just looked it up on the internet, you know. But it literally means to be daring. And I believe that if we're simply responding to Jesus, because we believe in the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because we believe in the one who died and rose again, then God just doesn't invite us just to like kind of float through life, that God has a plan. There's something he wants to do. And as we fulfill our mission of simply responding to Jesus, he's going to invite us to take steps that we wouldn't normally take. So we like to say here that our vision as a church is audacious. And you want your vision for your life to be audacious. Now, you might say, well, well Fusco, what, what's the vision of Crossroads? I'm so glad you asked. You all know this real well. It's going to show up on your screen right now. We like to say that our vision is that because Jesus is real, go, you can say it with me, we're a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. See, I believe this is an audacious vision. Now, notice, you notice the upward, inward, and outward quality of our vision statement? Yeah, why? Because Jesus is real. We put Jesus up top. And I'm so proud, so many of you have the Jesus is real stickers on your car. You know, like, I, there's nothing more encouraging when I'm driving, I see a Jesus is real sticker. Because it it, it's a reminder that we believe that Jesus is real. He's street level. We don't need to be overly smart. We don't need to be overly sophisticated. People all the time like, hey, oh, you're at Crossroads? What's this whole Jesus is real thing? I'm like, what do you think it means? Well, I just think it means Jesus is, he, he's real. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's what it means. He's real. Right? And we're simply responding. He's alive today. He's at street level. And because Jesus is real, that's the upward, because we want to be with Jesus in a year of renewal. Once we're with Jesus, because he's real, then we're going to what? Be the church. Because Jesus, we're what? We're a family of faith fully engaged. What that means is that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, he makes us his own special people. We become his family. We just read it in our Bible reading plan. Jesus said, who's my mother and my brothers except these who do the will of God? Right? And so we believe that because of Jesus, he makes us a family, a new family. And as a family, based on faith in Jesus, then we become fully engaged, which means everyone's got a role to play in this family. There's no such thing as someone who's part of the family who doesn't have a role to play. Now, don't get me wrong. Roles change over time, don't they? Right? Like I look at it with my beloved grandparents. There was a time when my grandfather was working and, 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 and providing for his family and, and, and being, and now as he's gotten older and as my grandma's older, we don't, like my grandma used to cook every meal. Now everyone cooks for her. Right? Because over time the roles change, but my grandma still has an essential part in the family. There's no such thing as a family member who's not fully engaged. There's a role, when you're a baby, you get to be a baby. Right? When you're getting mature, then you have more. I remember, I mean, this has happened for my family. The greatest day of my life was when my son Obadiah was old enough to mow the lawn. <laughs> there was a time I wouldn't let him mow the lawn, but now he's old enough. And now I'm off. Praise the Lord. Right? And he's happy to do it. He wants the responsibility. He wants to cruise around in the John Deere. I don't mind it at all, you know? It works out for everybody. Right? But each part has a role to play in our family. Right? And because Jesus is real, we're a family of faith, fully engaged. That's to be the church. And if we're going to be with Jesus, we're going to be the church. Then we're going to what? Be on mission, right? That's our year of renewal. And what are we doing? Because Jesus is real, we're a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. We're on mission. We're in the community. Now, one of the things that we decided to do for this service is, like, I want to be able to tell you some of the huge things that God has done for us and in this house over the last year. But, you know, there's an old saying that uh, pictures 
speak a thousand words, right? So I've asked our amazing creative arts team to make a, a video, kind of a recap video of just some of the big things that God did in 2019. And we're gonna watch that together. Now there's so many things on this video that I'm gonna encourage you to hold your applause to the end because literally you're gonna wanna applaud like every three seconds. Because it's so cool what God has done when you live out your mission that's simple and when God has given you an audacious vision and we all choose to jump on in and get involved in that. It's amazing what God has done in the last year. And one of the things I will say, and they're gonna show the video, and then we're gonna invite our staff to come up. I wanna pray for the men and women on our staff as well. Such amazing people as part of our families is that you'll notice there's a lot of numbers and facts. And I always like to remind people that every person is every number is a person, and every person is God's beloved. So like, when you're gonna see numbers of people getting baptized, people getting saved, people rededicating life. You have to realize that each person, God numbers every hair on every head. God loves them, God wants to do a work in their life, and we have seen God do some of the most outrageous things in 2019. So check out the screens and check out this video. What's amazing is, is that God has been writing a story here at Crossroads. 2019, we are calling a year of simplicity. Three areas of focus. Worship, the word, and the world. I promise you, you will find yourself right in the middle of the story that God is writing. At the start of 2020, we're remembering and celebrating the work of God in and through the Crossroads family in 2019. We worship together, and we dove deeper by participating in groups. We have loved every minute of hosting. It's given us the opportunity to take Daniel's message and just go much deeper with it. You see Crossroads through its people. That's what is the church, and this group has really brought the church of Crossroads to life for us. We took brand new steps of commitment to Jesus. I took the invite of a friend to come here, and it completely changed my life. I got baptized with Warren. And what he has for you is greater than anything else that this world can promise you. I'm the father that I never knew existed. Uh, I'm the brother that I never knew I could be. The loving son that cares for his family and his mom. Just like my sobriety date, it's a date that I'll never forget. We served and volunteered like never before, with 15% more of our church family serving than the year before. Together, we put in 40,000 volunteer hours in 2019. Our care ministry served almost 700 individuals with counseling, premarital and marital guidance, and other ongoing and emergency assistance, plus more than $40,000 distributed in benevolence funds. After Jack passed, I didn't want to live. I went to counseling for about eight weeks. I feel like the church just enclosed themselves around me. I realized what a church family really is. I have never felt more loved than I have since this experience. Every week was a cycle of working, drinking, trying to pay enough bills not to be homeless, but today it's not driving my life. I'm fortunate enough to be um, serving God on the Celebrate Recovery ministry. It's great. I love it. We did everything we could to reach people right where they're at with the good news that Jesus is real. More than 30,000 people from all over the world visited our internet campus, a 16% increase from 2018. And about 600,000 people follow us on social media. We reached more than 2 million people per month on Facebook, 3 million on YouTube, a 36% increase from the year before, hearing biblical truth and daily reminders of God's love while they scroll. We partnered with The Real with Daniel Fusco TV show, which reached more than 1.6 million people with the gospel, with more than 300 people starting brand new journeys with Jesus in 2019. The Responding Worship Band released two albums of all original music recorded here in our Crossroads production studio and toured 17 times. We're reaching the emerging generations. More than a thousand kids came to the 2019 BBS Summer Day Camp. We shared the gospel with more than 2,000 people who showed up for Harvest Jam, and we invited them back for church too. In 2019, we added a Jingle Jam Kids event to Christmas Eve, 
and sent invitations to the community, growing our Christmas Eve services by 13% for a total of 3,850 people. And our work with kids, families, youth, and young adults continues to grow because of your generosity. Last year, you gave $4.9 million during our weekly offerings. You also donated more than $2.5 million specifically to Heart for the House. Amazing contributions that helped us do the work of God in our community this year. We followed the call of God out beyond our community into our world through the work of Love Now, our social compassion and outreach ministry dedicated to reaching the world at its places of pain. Last year, you, the Crossroads family, raised $90,000 for the work of Love Now. 71 people from our church family traveled for five different serve and mission trips. We supported 37 missionaries all over the world and five organizations working to provide people with clean water, promote racial reconciliation, and support the needs of youth internationally. 900 members of the Crossroads family partnered with Love Now to serve our community for 3,000 hours through 12 work projects, collected thousands of items for local charities through our quarterly community drives, and donated thousands of pounds of food to the Salvation Army. Together, we are following the call of Jesus to transform our community and our world with His love. Here's to the work of God through the Crossroads family in 2019. We'll keep forging ahead in 2020. So I want to thank you all for being such an integral part of all of that, not just some of the big stuff. And so we've invited our staff to kind of come on out. We wanted to take a moment, you know, if you've been here at all, these men and women, it's our, it's our, our staff as well as our board members are here as well. Um, we want you just to, we want to take a moment just to pray for these men and women. I'll be honest, as a team, I am more than humbled and honored to be a part of this group of folks, these men and women are amazing. They are so committed to this family and all that we do here uh, is only possible because of their love of the Lord and their love of each other and their love of all of you. And so I wanted to just kind of, I mean, I could go down this list and we could be here for like three days and me like telling stories. And, but I did want to highlight just, uh, just two people um, just because I wanted to make sure that everyone knows. So first, I, I, many of you know Mikey Moore. Mikey, can you just wave at everybody? So Mikey, our worship leader. Um, so we're excited to announce that Mikey's been on staff here for over four years now, and we recently set apart Mikey as a pastor. So... <laughs> So we, we've absolutely loved watching how God has uh, raised him up and how God is using him as part of the Crossroads family. And the other person I want to uh, introduce many of you to is Pastor Rob Krennic. Rob, can you raise your hand? Um, so Pastor Rob recently came on staff as our pastor of families. I've known uh, Rob for a long time, pastored an amazing church in the San Francisco Bay Area. We became friends, and God moved him and his family up here, and we've been super excited to, to bring him on staff and to see how God is going to use him. And so uh, because, uh, you know, Pastor Rob is brand new, I wanted to make sure that everyone saw him and said, okay, so, so that, that's, past, that's our pastor, of our, our family's pastor there. And so, but literally, I can just shout out everybody who's standing up here. I like to tell people that everybody on this on our staff realizes that we're here to serve the Lord and to serve this house, you know? And so just the amount of uh, grit and grace, the expertise uh, in this group of folks from our staff, and then of course, uh, our board members here as well, just super grateful. So I wanna ask that everybody in our congregation just, just raise your hand to these men and women here in the front. And I wanna ask just all of you just to pray out loud for the Crossroads staff and for our board members. Just, everyone, we're gonna pray out loud and then I'm just gonna close with a, a simple prayer of blessing and grace. You guys can all lay your hand on each other in the front here as well. Go ahead, let's all pray for our staff. Go ahead. Father, I thank you so much for our staff. I th thank you for our board members, Lord. Thank you for these men and women, their families, Lord. And I just ask for you to do an amazing work of renewal in each one, a fresh anointing of your spirit, 
Lord, that you would give them all that they need, all, all, all wisdom, all grace that they need to be able to simply respond to you from a place on our staff. And God, we ask that your that who you are would continue to amplify in each one of their lives. Thank you for who they are. Thank you for what they're doing and how you're using them. Bless and keep each one of them. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's family said together, amen. Can we all stand and give these folks a big round of applause, our staff? All right, we love you all. Now go back to work. No, I just, I just, I'm so kidding. Everyone's like, man, we got things to do right now. I'll be honest, we got such an amazing team that God has brought together here. You know, and these men and women just love to serve this house, each one of you. So we've seen that our, our mission is simple. We're gonna simply respond to Jesus and that our, our vision is audacious. We like to also say that here at Crossroads, our operating system is biblical. Our operating system is biblical. Now, everyone knows what an operating system is, right? Like when you get a computer, the operating system is the, the software that helps all the different things you want to do on the program run. Now, as a church family, we have a very specific operating system that God has given us. And I say it's biblical because, you know, uh, for us, it's, you know, some people think it's unique when we tell them about it, but we just find it in the Bible and it's just kind of who we are. And so our operating system is something that we like to call Dr. Mister. And we call it Dr. Mister because you notice it's D-R, M, and R, right? You see that D-R is doctor and M-R is mister, right? And, and, so, and, and so really what we do is everything that we do here at Crossroads is, has to have these four components to it. So it needs to be devotional because we're devoted to the scriptures. We're Bible people here at Crossroads, unabashedly. We love God's word. We believe God's word. We're gonna do everything we do on God's So we're, we're devotional because every ministry at Crossroads and everything we do is biblical, right? R, it's relational, why? Because we're a family of faith. God has called us to be in relationship with one another, right? Then M, it's missional, right? Because, of course, God's called us to transform our community and our world. In our year of renewal, we're what? On mission. So every ministry at Crossroads has a off-the-crossroads campus, in the community, reaching the world at its places of pain component to it. And then the final R is that we're reproducible. Because really, what, the point of a family is to raise a child into productive adulthood. And really, the goal of Crossroads is to see each one of us move from the day we get saved into spiritual maturity. And so the church is meant to be a place where the work of spiritual reproduction happens. And so within every ministry, everything that we do here at Crossroads has those components. Now, you notice the upward, inward, and outward framework again. Like, it's everywhere because it's in the greatest commandments. Like, this is why we do this stuff. It's where we find this in the Bible. And so if you join any ministry at Crossroads, you're gonna see Dr. Mister at work. You're gonna see we're learning the scriptures. We're learning how to be a family that works together. We're seeking ways to be on mission in our community. And you're gonna be unabashedly encouraged to grow to maturity at Crossroads. So the idea of any of us being like, yeah, I'm, as f I'm not growing anymore, this is as far as I'm getting, this will be the most uncomfortable place in the world for you. Because we believe that we're all in process. God wants to do a work in all of us. Every day, he's helping us to know who we are and to walk in that. And so within the Crossroads family, this Dr. Mr. Framework is what, it's our operating system. Everything we do moves through that. So like if you're at men's ministry, you're gonna be doing mission, you're gonna be doing trips you know, into the community. If you're doing Celebrate Recovery, same thing. If, you, if you, our kids, we're encouraging them to take steps of faith. Everything that we do is kind of driven by this Dr. Mr. Framework. And so, and we just see that to be what the Bible teaches, right? Just like the early church, they were, they were devoted to the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, prayers, and the whole thing. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do as a church, reaching the world. And so, because our mission is simple, and because our vision is audacious, our operating system is biblical, all of this is impossible unless we make sure that we remind ourselves that our Lord is unstoppable. And, 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 and brothers and sisters, can I be honest with you? I've been a pastor now, I, I can't believe it, for almost 20 years. And it's so true, like I was born into the pastorate. No, I'm just kidding. I totally wasn't, but I've been in it for a long time. And it's amazing how with each 
kind of passing of the seasons of life. You always hear all these things about the church and the church is this and the church is dying and, you know, and it's just like, no. The reason the church will never die is because Jesus is unstoppable. You know, and, and as long as Jesus is the head of the church, then the church is unstoppable because the gates of Hades can't prevail against the church. Now, don't get me wrong. At every turn, we have to make sure that Jesus is the center. We have to make sure that we're living upward first. And, and what happens if you read church history is that the church has a bad habit, and I mean the church in a universal sense, has a bad habit of getting focused on other things other than Jesus. Right? We, they begin to develop our own agendas. And so sometimes when things, when people start talking about the church struggling or this or that, you know, I'm always reminded that if the church has Jesus at the center, because Jesus is unstoppable, I mean, listen, a Roman cross couldn't stop him. Guards and a stone in front of a tomb couldn't stop him. He's unstoppable. And as long as we keep Jesus front and center, Crossroads is gonna be unstoppable because Jesus is. And with each passing year, when I think about the legacy that God is building here, not only 44 years of history, but as long as the Lord tarries, as a church family, we promise you that we're gonna keep preaching Christ and him crucified. We're gonna keep teaching the scriptures and we're gonna keep trying to simply respond to him. And what that means is that there'll be seasons when we'll be like, hey, we're not gonna stop doing that. We're gonna start doing this. Hey, in order to reach people, we have to do this thing. There's all these course corrections that we need to make as a church family. But even if you think about the video you just saw of what God did in 2019, what we call the year of simplicity, God continues to impact heaven and this community in this world through you all. And so I just wanna encourage you as I draw this message to a close is listen, don't forget who you are in Christ. Don't forget that God saves us so that we, you and I, can be royal priests. That we can be a special people. That you and I, we can be as holy nation because we're chosen to walk in light. Although we weren't as people before, we get to be as people today. Although we were away from his mercy in the past, today we've received his mercy. And as we remember who we are and as we simply respond to Jesus and as because Jesus is real, we're a family of faith fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. And as we run this operating system of being Dr. Mister at every turn, what I will tell you is that Jesus will keep reaching people. And Jesus will keep seeing people's lives transformed. And as we follow him and simply respond, he'll keep transforming our life. And I'm here to tell you, there's nothing that speaks more volumes than a life that's been changed. And if you're here today and you're already a follower of Jesus, if you're part of God's family, then listen, Jesus is unstoppable. He wants to use you. He wants you to be a part of what he's doing. You have purpose. No matter what stage of life you're in, step into that purpose. We want all of you to be in the group. We want all of you to be in ministry together as the church so that we can be on mission together. So take those steps of faith. And listen, if you're here today and you have not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus, whether you're here in our sanctuary in Vancouver, you're joining us online, listen, God wants you to be the recipient of his mercy. God wants to call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God wants you to receive Jesus. He doesn't want you to stumble at the stumbling stone. He wants you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And if that's you and you're here today, I'm gonna give you an opportunity in just a second to, to receive God's mercy. Let Jesus, who is unstoppable, be who God wants him to be in your life, which is your Lord, your Savior, your Messiah. So let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together.